Hello there everyone, UXW Bill here once again. You know, there are people in the world that say I never get anything done. Sometimes they're right, but every now and again I manage to pull things off. And today, my dad and I are at College 153's place, getting ready to work not only on this long forgotten Kenmore dryer, for which we have a replacement heating coil over here. Go ahead and pop this out of the box just so you can see it. And my apologies for the low light conditions down here, but when this is all the light you've got, you've got to make it work. Isn't that an amazing little piece of engineering right there? My dad tells me that Maytag actually makes you uh, thread the replacement heating coil onto the former, but Whirlpool is very kind to us in that it's already preformed. Can you believe that this bad boy dissipates some 5400 watts at 240 volts AC? That's pretty impressive. However, the washer, which was formerly reliable, has also died. It seems that it would run appropriately in every setting except for one, and that's the spin cycle. Well, I came down here and looked at it once already, and uh, shot some deoxid-based cleaner into it. That got it going for a little while, but as you'll see in just a moment, the timer was pretty much beyond help because it switches the uh, motor for the washing machine directly, and after nearly 30 years of that, time finally caught up with the contacts. Now that I've gone ahead and taken the control panel loose, well actually it was already loose, in fact we left it loose from the last time we were here trying to get this thing to go again, you can see everything that makes an automatic washing machine of this particular vintage work. This is the water level switch which works on the concept of air pressure pressing against a diaphragm sort of switch that turns off the water inlet solenoids. I'm a little surprised that Whirlpool decided to put the uh, motor run capacitor up here in the control panel instead of down on the motor, but that's how they did it. And then there's the whole brains of the operation, the timer for the automatic washing machine. And then of course over here we have the temperature selector switch, which naturally allows you to choose the temperature for both the wash and in fancier machines, the rinse cycle. And of course you can see the start of an electrical schematic as well as a uh, connection matrix, but that goes down inside the machine to where you can't actually see all of it. So it's kind of of limited use, usefulness unless you take the uh, rear of the panel of the machine off. Now in preparation to change out the timer, of course you have to get it out of there, and that had us all stopped for a little bit. At first I thought that this knob could be pried off, but that's not true. With the switch in the, uh, I believe it's the off position when it's pushed in, am I correct in stating that? Yes, says College 153 in the background. <laughs> okay, with that switch in the off position, we can unscrew this uh, knob, and then take this decorative trim ring off, which is just a press fit, and now you can see screws that hold the timer in place. There are two of them. And here, of course, is the timer removed from the machine. Now, at first look, when it comes to servicing this, things look pretty grim because it's clearly not intended to be worked on. There's twisted over tabs and stuff. But if you gently untwist these and you're careful and you don't drop it on the floor, <laughs> you can have a look inside and then the damage will become readily evident to this thing's terminals. And you'll see why deoxid could not possibly have hoped to reverse a situation that was already too far gone. But you really can't blame this thing for quitting early because like I say this machine dates from about 1985 near as any of us can tell and as far as we know it's been pretty reliable over that time. It's certainly been more reliable than its sibling over here, the Maytag Neptune, which if you ask me was definitely the beginning of the end for a once great company. And in fact, this machine is exceedingly temperamental. It doesn't like to fill properly. It doesn't like to stay on to finish its cycle. Whereas even when this thing was dying, well, it was still trying to work <laughs> to some extent. Let's go ahead and unbox the new timer, which is over here. And you can see that not a whole heck of a lot has changed over the years as far as these are concerned. The assembly has been... Uh, has been simplified and definitely cheapened a bit, but if you place the two right next to one another, you can definitely see there's not a whole heck of a lot of difference between them. Even the motor is very much the same thing, just a little AC synchronized timing motor. Before I get into what caused the failure and show you exactly what went wrong, I'd like to take a moment to discuss how the automatic washing machine timer works. 
An automatic washing machine's timer is effectively its brain in that it governs every possible operation the machine can perform and provides a crude means of making a, so to speak, decision about what should happen next as the machine moves through its cycle. Everything starts right here on the back side of the timer with this little motor. This is an AC synchronous motor, that is to say that its rate of rotation is tied directly to the AC power line frequency. And as long as it is running from the correct frequency or the frequency on the power line is accurate, this is a very stable timing source. Of course, you need a timing source in this case to govern how long the machine should spend on each cycle. As this motor operates, it turns this stepped or indexed drum inside the timer body. Now you can't really take this timer apart without chancing disaster. However, it's possible to take it just apart enough so that you can reveal the magic inside. Everything starts when the user turns the machine off and turns the dial, which is much easier to do with the knob attached, to select the particular cycle that they want. Then they pull out on this shaft, which turns power on to the timing motor. It also provides power to the other circuitry in the machine. When the timing motor starts running, it begins to turn this stepped drum very slowly. Now in some cases, the timer motor goes to sleep by way of an outside influence such as the water level switch so that the timer won't be running and therefore there is no time restriction on the, on how long it takes the machine to actually fill with water and then when the water fill switch is tripped the timer in turn can be re-energized and the cycle can continue it's really pretty ingenious if you think about it so what goes wrong here well the simple fact of the matter is this switch bears the entire brunt of the current going to the water flow solenoids, but more importantly than that, the washing machine motor. And it is the washing machine motor that pulls so very, very hard. If we look at the rating on the back of this, you will see that it is rated to switch either 7.5 amps at 250 volts AC or 15 amps at 125 volts AC. Even though it's built to take that kind of a load, the slow motion of this turning drum means that sometimes a contact make or break isn't exactly clean. And over time, that leads to arcing at the contact points and therefore that will eventually wear the timer out. In order to try to delay this eventuality, the timer contacts are silver plated so as to prevent arcing damage. But eventually the silver plating gets burned through, leaving only the underlying copper. And the copper is much more susceptible to arcing damage. If I go ahead and pop this little guard out of place, which takes just a little bit of doing, it's not particularly easy to do it on video, because as you can see, when I pop one end out, the other end tends to pop back in place. But with a little bit of work, I should be able to get it to come loose here, and I can show you what happened to the contacts inside this timer, and what led to the ultimate failure of the spin cycle. I would have expected perhaps this would happen to the main power contact first, but now you can see these sort of reed-like contacts that actually make the timer work. And you can see how the stepped drum is actually pressing down to make some of them make contact, while others are not making contact. While it's very difficult to see, probably, from your perspective on the camera, you can see that some of these contacts, especially this one right here, have sustained arcing damage over the years. I did actually try to clean this up. It was a lot worse before I got started with it but no amount of cleaning was effective in returning this timer to service. The best I ever got the machine to do when the power was turned on to the spin cycle was to simply hum in a very unsatisfactory manner. And of course, whenever that motor starts up, it's going to pull probably three or four times its rated current, which means that it may well exceed the current ratings of this timer, thus leading to damage. Now maybe they could have staved off the damage for a longer period of time if they'd have used relays, but one really can't argue with the fact that this timer lasted for a very, very long time. And that today, it's still available and relatively easy to replace. You can probably better see some of the results from the arcing and burning damage as the contacts heated up over the years inside this plastic guide that surrounds the contacts in order to prevent short circuiting. But that's a basic tutorial on how one of these things work and it also shows you what ended up going wrong and causing this one not to work. 
This timer assembly is pretty much toast. Even if I cleaned up those contacts, they would probably fail very soon again because the silver plating on them is gone. However, I think I might hold on to this little line synchronous motor as it might be useful for making some sort of a clock or an actuator or something like that. And it still seems to run perfectly well. Now putting the, time, the new timer in is no great shakes because it mounts in exactly the same way as the old one did. You have these two holes here to accept the screws that go through the front panel. Then you put the knob back on and the electrical connection back in place. Plug it into the wall and we'll see what happens. If everything's good, go ahead and put this unit back together. And there's definitely some progress being made over here on the dryer. But it looks like it's a little bit slower than what I'm getting done on the washer even with pausing to take video for all of you. So let me go ahead and get the timer mounted in place and I'll be right back thanks to the magic of video editing. Well folks, it certainly wasn't as easy as it should have been, but as you can see, he's just waiting to turn it on and see if it works, so give it a shot. All right, the drain pump's running. That's definitely a good sign. And when I, when I say that it wasn't as easy as it should have been, I mean that specifically the screw holes on the timer were just a little bit too small. But with power tools, and this is arguably not the right way to do anything before I get ripped apart about that in the video comments, you can make just about anything happen, and I did. This is appliance repair on a budget, folks. <laughs> but once I had the timer screwed in and the wiring harness plugged in, just a simple matter of screwing the knob back on after pressing the trim piece on underneath. And in a moment we'll see if it manages to run the spin cycle. Okay. Got one spin cycle going here. I love defeating the safety switches on these things. Don't try this at home, kids. And definitely don't put your brother, sister, or your worst enemy in here. Or even your best friend, because uh, I'm pretty sure it'll end badly. And we just started a fresh load of laundry over in this washing machine. So in the meantime, while we're waiting for that to get done, we can take a look at the old heating coil from the dryer. And while this thing tests open circuit, none of us have been able to find the break in the heating element coil. And in fact, it could be so small as to be invisible. I've certainly seen that happen in the past, but only a time or two. And there's definitely some progress being made on getting the new one installed here. This, as you can see, is a pipe that allows for airflow over the heating element and then the dispensation of hot air into the drum. The airflow actually works a little differently than you might expect in that the fan pulls air across the laundry and you can see the air intake grill inside the drum there. But what that does mean is that even with the thermal cutouts in this machine functional, airflow is vital to the survival of that element and if the airflow gets blocked as we suspect it did on this machine, if the airflow gets blocked for any reason, the thermal protectors may not act in time to save you from having to replace the heating element. So, if you have an electric or a gas dryer, right now might be a good time to check on the quality of your vent tubing, because stuff like this over here, this is not really good. This sag in this flexible tubing can allow for lint and even moisture buildup that blocks the flow of heated air from the dryer. Here's another good idea in regards to dryer care. Keep the lint filter clean. <laughs> this one's pretty bad. I can't actually get that lint to come off there by hand. Just... Okay, here we go for a test run. We'll just put it on about medium dry, hit the start button. And in a matter of seconds, that coil should start getting hot should glow visibly red. Oh yeah, I smell it heating up. Definitely smell the coating burning off of it. Hopefully nothing else is burning. <laughs> I'm really surprised you can't see it though. But it's definitely blowing warm air. Is that hot at all? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, there's 
here's our dream cycle running. You see more holes in the tub being exposed. Did you find our break in the element? No, there is no break in the element, honey. Oh, I thought you said you did. No. Oh yeah, there we go. We found it. There it is, folks. Very easy to overlook. Well, let's see if we begin a spin cycle here in just a moment. We certainly should do something. certainly do make some interesting noises. Then again, so does this machine. This smells hot. Dryer. Good, good hot or bad hot? Good. Well, you want them to heat. We um, found it. Oh, yeah. That's why we're working. Now, could you fix that with some solder? No, you couldn't solder it, but you could try tack welding it. Okay. I'll go through. Thank you for watching and feel free to leave a comment if you have one. <laughs> I seem to have a dryer lid on me. I can't possibly imagine why. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> A little bit of it. Well, that's good.